and the land was peaceful 40 years. Thank you to all our readers. And I'm just going to ask the Lord uh, to make his word come alive. Father, we have heard what you've done. And we're in, we're in awe of your goodness. We're in awe of your salvation. And we pray now that you would make it come alive to us in 2021. We know that you are the God who has done these things. You have worked salvation. And you continue to show yourself, Father, mighty to save. Make it come alive here and now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, obviously, this morning we're going to be uh, working through Judges 4 and 5, and yet there may be a few of you who are ready to throw the flag because you're wanting to say, wait, 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 Zeb, what about the very last verse of chapter 3? What, are we just going to ignore Shamgar and his ox goad? My answer is absolutely not. We're not going to ignore Shamgar. There's, there's a total of 12 judges in this book that we're reading, the, the book of Judges. About six of them are generally considered major judges, and six are considered minor judges. They're, they're not minor because the work that they did was less important or they were weaker. Uh, this is not the JV squad of the judges. The minor judges are just called minor because we've got less information to go on as it relates to their lives and what they did. So, so take Shamgar. If you're uh, looking right before we picked up in, in uh, chapter 4, there's a one-liner account of God's deliverance through him, through his ministry. We, uh, we hear that Shamgar killed 600 Philistines with a piece of farm equipment. So I venture to say that he's pretty legit. Uh, and we're going to get to him. We're not going to pass over Shamgar. But because there's not a lot of information on him or the other minor judges, we'll do it this way. In a, in a couple weeks, just after Easter, we're going to do a message where we break down all of the minor judges together. One fell swoop. So have no fear. We're going to get to Shamgar. Uh, if you were you know, getting a little angsty here and now, thinking we were skipping over uh, uh, poor Shamgar, again, rest assured, we'll, we'll get to him. And let's turn our attention now to the bigger account that we've got to tackle today in Judges 4 and 5. If you're one of those organized types, I'm going to give you my outline in advance so you know exactly where we're going. And if you're not, just bear with me. All right. So, so here, here's what we're going to break down in the text. Chapters 4 and 5, we see an amazing account of what God did and then how God's people celebrated what God did. Uh, and so we'll, we'll start off by looking at the problem that God's people place, uh, faced and then the players. The problem and the players. Then we'll move to consider God's battle plan, what God did to work deliverance through Deborah and Barak. Uh, and, and then after we get to that battle plan and its execution, we're going to consider for a moment the victory song. That's chapter 5. Chapter 5 just rehashes what happened in chapter 4 in a celebratory, praising way. And so we'll see three important features of this victory song in chapter 5. And then finally, a little staccato point at the end of how it all ends. The, the last verse here in Judges 5 is very, very significant. It's really just a mirror of what it means for God's people to relate to him. And so we'll, we'll end on that one. The problem in the players, the battle plan, the victory song, and then a closing note on how it all ends. So let's, let's pick up with the problem. Chapter 4, verse 1, we see that this account is similar to what we have read and what we will continue to read. This account is altogether sad simple and cyclical. We, we read in verse 1, again, God's people did what was evil in his eyes. So he turns them over. Literally, the language here in the Hebrew is he sells them in, into the hands of an oppressor. So let's look at these players involved. We'll start with the enemy. His name or at least his title, is Jabin. There's some question about whether the, the kings of Canaan went by a, an official name or a title, kind of like Pharaoh. Uh, Pharaoh wasn't actually the, the king of Egypt's name, but rather his title, right? Or, or uh, uh, there was a number of different ancient peoples that would do this. So uh, it's less important. We just know that 
He's referred to as Jabin, the king of Canaan. And Jabin's kind of taking a, a behind-the-scenes role. We know that he's the wicked power behind this oppression, but we really don't hear a lot about Jabin. Who we hear a whole lot about is his henchman, his right-hand man, the general named Sisera. Now, two observations about this Canaanite power, and particularly about Sisera, the general, and the army that he commanded. First, basic observation. you got to get this in your brain or you're not going to understand this account. They were stacked. Right? The deck was stacked in this battle. Canaan uh, had 900 chariots of iron, we're told. Now, that is an incredible number for this population, for this region in the world. And, and they tell us the chariots are made of iron. That's the best technology that, that they had at their disposal then. 900 chariots of iron. Translation, these things were death machines back then. The, the, the best military uh, technology that, uh, that was available. Think about, about this as the equivalent of tanks. A chariot could mow down dozens of foot soldiers very, very easily uh, with, with the equipment available, these strong war horses. Uh, they were really impenetrable. So when, when scripture tells us here that he had 900 chariots of iron, uh, you know, I don't know if that does anything for you, but for the Israelites, they were quaking in their boots or their sandals, whatever they were wearing. Uh, we also read that Canaan, and specifically the military might of Sisera, oppressed Israel, uh, my translation says cruelly. That, that word in verse 3 can mean forcefully. They were oppressed violently. They were in, oppressed intensely. That, that word can be translated in any of those ways. What, what, what scripture is telling us is that the kind of oppression that God's people endured under Jabin, under Sisera, was tremendously serious. It was dire. That they, they were beaten to a pulp, as it were. The, the oppression was just not there. It was cruel. It was intense oppression. So let's look at the deliverers that God raises up to, uh, to work his salvation. The first one we encounter in verse 4 is a woman by the name of Deborah. Uh, it's often thought that Deborah is the most sterling of judges in this entire book. We don't find one single detriment about her in the entire account. She shows herself to be faithful. She shows herself to be courageous. And we read in verse 4, chapter 4, verse 4, that Deborah has a dual role in Israel at this time. She's both a judge and she's a prophetess. Okay, more on Deborah later. So a judge and a prophetess. Now, we also hear about this character named Barak. Now, Barak is an interesting guy. We don't really get any information about who he is or what he's like or what he did. The emphasis here in chapter 4 is on his call, how God called him to deliver the people of Israel. So really the emphasis is on who's making the call here. And we see the answer in verse 6. The call on Barak's life was from, ultimately, Almighty God. Verse 6, has not the Lord, has not Yahweh commanded you, Deborah tells him. And yet, the call from God is channeled through somebody, right? The call from God is spoken through the prophetess, this other judge named Deborah. Now, I want to come up for air, as we, as we sometimes talk about, and, and talk about a transferable biblical principle that's really, really important before we keep slogging through the text here. Here's the big idea. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes, God will use someone else to speak directly into your life. We see that here. And we see that all throughout Scripture. Sometimes when God speaks, he speaks directly to a man, a woman, a child. But sometimes when God speaks, interestingly enough, he'll speak to someone else about you. He'll use someone else as a vehicle to minister into your life. And again, Scripture is just chock full. It's just replete with examples of this. Let me just give you a couple for instances. In 2 Samuel 12, we read about David, you know, King David, the exemplar of a biblical leader, a man after God's own heart, 
who blew it big time several, on several instances. But in this one particular instance, man, it is bad. It's about as bad as you get. Cold-blooded murder, adultery. It is, it, it's really, really bad with this man of God. And he needs confronted. God loves him enough to tell him he needs to change course. Now, God often spoke to David directly, but in this one account, 2 Samuel 12, God doesn't speak to David directly. He sends Nathan the prophet to go approach David. He tells him a little parable, a little story. It's a convincing uh, narrative. You should go check it out, 2 Samuel 12. But the point is that when David needed confronted about his sin, God sent someone else to do it. Isn't that interesting? We see the same thing in the New Testament as well. I'll give you two quick examples. In Acts chapter 8, we have an account of a pagan uh, court official from the country of Ethiopia. And he's kind of traveling through the region of Israel, and he's riding on his chariot. We don't know his name. They just call him the Ethiopian eunuch. And God has got his crosshairs on this Ethiopian eunuch. God's drawing him in, calling him to himself. Now, God could have spoken to this Ethiopian eunuch and saved him, but he didn't choose to do that directly. He chose to tap the shoulder of a guy named Philip, the evangelist Philip, and he sends Philip, he doesn't know why he's there, to this region, and he starts to run alongside this guy's chariot, hops on board. He shares the gospel with this Ethiopian eunuch. He gets saved. It's incredible. All of a sudden, they start to pass some water on their chariot, and he's like, hey, why shouldn't I get baptized? They hop down off the chariot. They dunk the guy in the river, and then it's just the craziest account, I think. One of, one of the more wild accounts in the book of Acts, literally, Philip just disappears. He's like teleported. He vanishes and appears somewhere else in another part of the countryside. Uh, so, so God miraculously is going to save and restore this Ethiopian eunuch from death to life. But he uses someone else, Philip, as the vehicle through which that salvation comes. One more. The very next chapter, uh, the very famous account of the Apostle Paul. We talk about him often, his radical salvation experience. Now, when, when Paul confronts Jesus, Jesus does the dirty work himself. Literally knocks him down, shows him a vision of himself, blinds him. And then Paul stumbles into the city of Damascus where he was supposed to be persecuting and killing the Christians. Now, all of a sudden, he finds himself come face to face with this Jesus who's legit, who's real, who's the Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't know what to do, and he's blind. Now, Jesus had just dealt with Paul individually, but he sends someone else in Damascus to restore his sight, to pray over him and to commission him in ministry. Scales uh, fall off of his eyes, physical scales, and he can see once again. What's the point I'm driving at? I'm trying to help you understand that God uses many means, many avenues to get our attention. The sovereign God of all the earth can and does speak directly and intimately to our hearts at times and one of his preferred, one of his favorite means of communicating to his people is other people. So let me bring this into the here and now. I, I want to ask you, has this ever happened to you? I'd be willing to wager that many of you are here today at Friendship Community Church because someone else was sent by God to convict you of sin, to share the gospel, to challenge you in a certain way. Maybe you felt the encouragement that's come when God used somebody else to do something profound in your life, minister to a particular need. Many of us knows what, uh, know intimately what this looks like. There was a spiritual catalyst that God used. So, so here's my simple application this week. Be that person. Be that person to others. Scripture tells us that we in Christ are Christ, God's ambassadors in the world. We're ministers of reconciliation. We're supposed to be here in southwestern Pennsylvania and throughout the world, salt and light. 
People are supposed to look at us and savor and see the goodness of our God. One of the many reasons, friend, why you are here right now is to minister to a broken, bleeding, dark world around you. To lift up, to, to, to share God's glory and goodness in Christ. And to lift up the body of Christ. Be that person to others. God delights to work through other people. Let's, let's move on. Let's look at God's uh, battle plan here. God speaks to Barak. He does it through Deborah. Let's see what's going down. The first thing God says is that I, not you, I am going to draw out Sisera, verse 7 at the beginning. I'm going to draw him out to the river Kishon. And then he says again, later in the verse, like a bookend, I am going to give him into your hand. God says, Sisera's going down, and I'm going to do it. By the way, he's bringing his chariots with him. All those 900 chariots of iron that you guys are so deathly afraid of. The chariots are coming too, and that's not going to sway my victory one bit. Notice there's two details that God gives us in advance. Think about this. In advance of how this battle is going down. The first and you should star this. If you're somebody who makes a note in your Bible or if you take notes, this is a really big deal in this passage. Star or underline, highlight uh, where it talks about the river Kishon. We'll circle back to that later. The river Kishon. And then also we see that after Barak balks, after he, he hesitates, he knows he's called by God to do something, but he sees uh, Deborah as, as the, the real judge, the real faithful one. I, I'm not going to go, he says, unless you come with me. After that hesitancy, we hear that the glory of mighty Sisera's defeat is going to come at the hands of a woman. Not you, Barak. You get to participate. You get to play along in the part of this redemptive history but the, the, the real glory, the final glory, is going to go to a woman. Now, at this point in time, we're tempted to think that the woman is Deborah. And, and to be sure, uh, she, she gets a lot of credit for her faithfulness. We're still talking about her thousands of years later. But we find out later that the glory, in a very particular way, is going to come to some other woman introduced later in the story. Now, just pause for a minute. Um, we need to address the Barak problem. Barak often gets a bad rap because of his hesitancy to follow God's plan. And we certainly can't excuse this. God does softly rebuke him through Deborah. But I think it's important that we don't push our criticism of Barak too far for at least two reasons. One, he's in real good company. He's in real good company. You know anybody who has ever been hesitant to follow God's call for their life? Anybody in scripture or in life, in experience around you, who, who they knew God was working on their heart, God was drawing them or causing them, and they dug both heels in and said, uh-uh. Welcome to life. Welcome to the faith, shaky as it is, of God's people Join the club, Barak. Listen to some other notable figures throughout the course of redemptive history who were reluctant to follow God's plan. First, most glaring example, I think, Moses. God raises Moses up, shows him this burning bush that's not being consumed or burned and, and speaks through it in the desert. Moses is like, what? God reveals himself through signs and wonders, and Moses says, Oh, uh-uh. <laughs> Go back where? Egypt? As, as a matter of fact, Moses is so hesitant to follow God's plan, God starts to get frustrated. He almost kills him. You can read about that account with a knife and a piece of skin. It's a wild story. But Moses, the man of God, the epitome of a strong leader of God's people who ushers them from slavery to the edge of the promise, and Moses, a reluctant hesitant leader. Jonah. Go to Nineveh, Jonah. I was reading a children's Bible with my kids. I like how the children's Bible put it. And Jonah heard the word of the Lord 
and got on a boat and said, one ticket to not Nineveh, please. If Nineveh's this way, I'm going uh, this way. Nineveh was like ISIS, the, Assyri the, the seat of the Assyrian Empire. Godless, wicked, violent nation. Jonah wanted nothing to do with him. He probably was fearing for his life. Jeremiah. God speaks to him and he says, God, I can't do what you're calling me to do. I'm just a youth. I'm too young. I don't know anything. God says, Shut up, Jeremiah. Who gave you your mouth? It's literally, oh, loose translation. Who gave you your mouth? Gideon. Wait, this is next week. We, we read about Gideon. Not once, not twice, three times. God miraculously steps in and gives assurance and confidence to Gideon's shaky faith. Doubting Thomas, just to get, sprinkle in a New Testament example followed Jesus for three years, saw all the miracles, and then watched him die on a cross. They start to say, he's, he's risen. Thomas, you're not going to believe it, he's risen. He said, no, nah, I saw it. I saw it. Unless I can put my fingers in his hands and in his side, I'm never going to believe it. And God said, well, then you can spend eternity in hell. No, he didn't. God's Jesus shows up and he says, Thomas, put your fingers here. Are you catching a pattern? The hero of this whole book is not these people whose stories we're reading about. It's the God they worship. Barak shows up and of course he's scared. You read about the chariots. This is like, you know, he's not like losing a game of cards. This is life or death. And God patiently bears with Barak. Let's not forget also, second reason, we can't be too, too hard on Barak. He's in the hall of faith for crying out loud. You can jot this down next to Barak's name in uh, Judges chapter 4. Hebrews 11, 32 to 34. We see this, this amazing example in the book of Hero, uh, Hebrews, often referred to, nicknamed the hall of faith of just faithful deeds done over and over and again. God commending God's people for their faith of old. And guess who's there? Barak. So did he waver? Yeah. Should he have wavered? <laughs> no. And God graciously got him where he needed to be. So before we move on to see the exploits that God worked through Deborah and Barak, let's just pause for a moment and acknowledge for you and for me that God's grace is bigger than our inadequacy. Aren't you glad for that? Let's say it again. God's grace is bigger than your fear. God's grace is bigger than your doubt. God's grace is bigger than your inadequacy. All right, let's keep tracking. They're about to throw down. The battle is upon us. We're about to get to the climax of the story after uh, Barak's call and Deborah is going with him. And then we get this really interesting and somewhat odd punctuation to the story. We, we get this seemingly random verse. Let's, let's read again Judges 4, verse 11. Again, we're, we're about to get to the battle scene, and we read, Now Heber the Kenite, what? Who? Heber the Kenite had separated from the Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, and had pitched his tent as far away as the oak in Zaynanim, which is near Kadesh. What? What? <laughs> I thought we were about to fight a battle here. This is an interesting and yet purposeful insertion of the Lord. We, we're tempted to say, God, why this random note about Heber the Kenite? Why this random note about how he's moving his family and settling at such and such a place? That could strike you and me as somewhat odd. Kind of feels like a commercial break. Remember commercials before we could skip them, right? Kind of feels like a commercial break, right? Like we're, we're ready for the battle and then, oh, to be continued after this brief infomercial but i think what we see here is god's purposeful and sovereign hand at work 
We're tempted to say, who the heck is Hebrew the Kenite, and why are we hearing about his family move in the middle of a battle scene? Well, hold on, friend. This is actually pretty important. One commentator, my go-to guy for the book of uh, Judges by the name of Dale Ralph Davis, one commentator says this about chapter 4, verse 11. He says, not even Heber's U-Haul was outside Yahweh's plan. I like that. And this tent where Heber the Kenite happened to pitch in the middle of who knows where in this region just so happens to be the same tent where his wife, named Jael, makes an end to the mighty general Sisera. This is actually the first place where uh, the phrase is coined. Maybe you've heard it before. Nailed it. <laughs> Sounded better in my head, sorry. I'm not going to do that on Wednesday. In this day, it was women's work to set up and tear down the tents. This was a semi-nomadic society. They were constantly moving their tents to find slightly better ground, and it was considered women's work to do that. And suffice it to say, these stakes that she used to anchor down these tents were not like the plastic ones we get at Walmart. Suffice it to say, JL was very comfortable with a mallet and a tent peg, and she knew exactly what she was doing. You see, it was just as God had appointed in advance. He didn't need chariots. He didn't need superior military force to vanquish this mighty general Sisera. He was going to do it with a single woman and her tent peg. God's just flexing. Now, in case you were feeling bad for poor Sisera, keep in mind that Sisera, this general, this Canaanite general, is not a good guy who got merely caught on the wrong side of a battle. If you want proof, go to chapter 5, verse 30, right at the end of the, end of the passage. We get a window into the life of Sisera and his typical way of conquering and oppressing people when he would be victorious in battle. Chapter 5, verse 30 it tells us that part of his spoil was quote, a womb or two for every warrior. How many of your translations say is a woman or two, or a girl or two, a maiden or two? The literal Hebrew phrase is best translated, a womb or two for every warrior. Your, some of your English translations are being a little nice, taking a little edge out of it. What was happening? They would come sweeping in, conquering in, and then they would ruthlessly rape the helpless women whose land they would conquer. This isn't poor Sisera who got caught on the wrong side of the battle. Scripture is clear that it is right, friend, it is good to celebrate when the wicked are brought to justice. Now, we don't have time to read it all, but if you're struggling with this idea of how God can love, but God can also judge, I just want to recommend that you read the end. Read Revelation. There's one, there's many places we can see this theme, but one place in particular, Revelation 19 Verses 1 to 3. You can go chase that down later this week. Revelation 19, 1 to 3. Where God's people in heaven stop for a praise break. There's a lot of praise breaks in heaven. And they're praising him for his salvation and his justice. And God's people in heaven, at the end, you're going to be one of these if you're in Jesus. You know one of the things they say? Hallelujah. For the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. Yee. That's kind of hard to think about, isn't it? But before a righteous and holy and perfect God, the wages of sin is death, is eternal destruction. This is why we're here, because of what God saved us of. 
It is good and it is right for God's people to celebrate when God punishes evil. And that's precisely what God's people do in chapter 5. Let's keep, keep moving. Now, in chapter 5, we get the key to how the Lord routed Sisera's seemingly impenetrable army. It's spelled out in what's often called the victory song, Deborah and Barak's victory song. Let's turn our attention there. I want to give you three quick things, three takeaways from chapter 5, this victory song. The first is just a, a, a high-level 50,000-foot view, a big-picture observation, and it's simply this that God's people responded to their deliverance with praise. Don't rush by that. It's what we do. God's people respond to their deliverance with praise. That's, that's part of what it means to worship. Worship isn't just praise, but man, is it a critical piece. Worship. There's many ways you can define worship. What is worship? Well, one thing worship is, at its core, is our response to God for who he is and what he's done. Listen then. God's people have and will always be, forever and ever, a singing people. God's people are a singing people. We're not all good at it. I'm not very good at it, actually. I, I think in my resurrected body, God's going to give me a better, better pair of vocal cords. But God's people sing. It's one of the things we do. Listen, if, you're, if your conscience is so seared that you respond to how you were on a, on a path to eternal hell and death, and God rescued you through no good of your own, plucked you off that path and put you on a path to eternal joy and peace and life, and your response to that is, huh, all right, thanks, God. I wonder if you got a spiritual pulse. What God has done for us in Jesus is incalculably good. It should evoke, it should tweak within our souls a desire to respond in praise, in worship. Certainly that's more than just singing, but it includes singing. My dad, wise man, would often say, you know, I can often tell when I'm looking around at church on Sunday who's really dialed into the goodness of God and who's just sort of on autopilot. Now, we got to be careful. My dad was not saying that the more physically demonstrative you are in, in worship time, in praise time, the closer you are to God. That's not true. We're all wired differently. Some of us are singing praise to God with our hands raised. Hallelujah. By the way, that's a biblical posture of worship and praise, not just some wacky charismatic thing. Some of us are just internal, internally chewing on these words that we're singing, praying to God. But you can see, regardless of what your personality is or isn't, how, how physically demonstrative you are, you can see if someone is savoring in the goodness of God. Or just sort of, God's people sing what we do now I, we're, we're not going to get to it all I, I, again if you if you want to if you want to press on this a little bit i don't know about that Zeb. i'm not much of a C couple for instances i'll give you uh, another song go go find exodus 15 when god's people were on the edge of the red sea and god parted the sea and they walk across on dry ground that's the part we tell there's a second part to that story it's when the egyptian army followed Time out. <laughs> Just a quick tangent. Why in the world, if you miraculously saw the sea split in half and God delivering his people, would you say, oh, now I'm going to get them? <laughs> right? like, 
God's fighting for them. You stay far away, man. It rushed right after him. And what's God do? He just collapses the sea over the Egyptian army. Their oppressive overlords who had their blood in mind have become vanquished. And what do God's people do? There's like a praise break in the middle of Exodus. It's an entire chapter, Exodus 15. It's called the Song of Moses and Miriam. Read Revelation. I keep on telling you that. It's almost like that's important. You should know what happens at the end. You know, Revelation is just riddled with songs. It's often called the New Testament hymn book of the Bible. At least 15 songs or song fragments in the book of Revelation. One of them, just another 15, I'll throw it at you. Revelation 15, called the Song of Moses and the Lamb. We're still singing about God's deliverance through Moses in heaven. And then you got like the entire book of Psalms, the, the literal hymn book of God's people Israel. A week or two ago, we, we cited Psalm 40. He, he drew me up from the pit of destruction, from the miry clay. He set my feet upon the rock. That's salvation, friend. Now, the next verse, the next part of that verse is, he put a new song in my mouth. A song of praise to our God. Why? Because when your feet were mired in clay and God rips you out of the clay and sets your feet on the rock, man, your heart should be doing some singing in that moment. So I'm just going to ask you before we get to the battle, are you singing? I know it's hard. Does your soul sing? Is there a song of praise in your heart to God for what he's done for you? Let's keep going. Let's see how this victory song rolls out. We got to see. It's amazing. God's divine intervention that utterly demolished Sisera's army. The key, here's the key to the military element of this, is back in chapter 4, verse 7. It's exactly what the Lord said. Let's reread it together. God's talking about his battle plan. He tells us ahead of time what he's going to do. He says, I'm going to draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you, ding, 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 at the river Kishon with his chariots and troops. I will give him into your hand. Where? At the river Kishon. That's not an accident. God says, I'm going to draw this big bad general to a very specific place, to this river Kaishan. Now, this is often lost on us because there's not many of these around in southwestern Pennsylvania. But keep in mind, this is the Middle East. And this word that we translate in English, river Kaishan, it's also translated torrent in chapter 15, can also be translated wadi, W-A-D-I, wadi, the wadi kaishan. And you're like, Zeb, what are you doing with the, your Middle Eastern geography right now? <laughs> this is important. This is the key to the victory that happens. Again, we're, in the, we're talking about the Middle East, and something we don't experience here but is very common in the Middle East and in regions that have an extreme dry season and a rainy season is this geographical feature. It's a landscape feature called a wadi. I'll just tell you what it is. A wadi is a dry riverbed or a stream. It's dry most of the year except during the rainy season. Now, if you ever get the chance to go to Israel, one of these days, I'd love, we're going to take a group to Israel one day, dream of mine. Actually, uh, there, there's a couple here who's been to Israel with me. I'm looking at you and I'm thinking about wadis, right? So, so a dried up riverbed, except for during the rainy season. When it rains, that hard cement-like ground can't handle a sudden influx of water. You know what happens? Flash floods, raging torrents of water. That's a wadi. Here's the point. Let me just spell it out for you as simply as I can. The Lord is going to open up the heavens 
and send a flash flood to take out Sisera's army and to render his flashy iron chariots totally useless. Listen, Deborah tells us, listen, chapter 5. I'm going to put this up. Let's put this up, uh, Bob, that uh, image. God spells this out how this went down in Judges chapter 5. Two different places, verses 4 and 5. Lord, Deborah sings, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the region of Edom. By the way, who's going out? Who's marching? Who's fighting this battle? The Lord is. Yahweh is. What happened? Well, the earth trembled. Here it is. The heavens dropped. What do you mean by that, Deborah? Well, she tells us, yes, the clouds dropped water. The mountains quaked before the Lord. Some commentators believe in addition to the, the flash flood, there was an earthquake. Even Sinai before the Lord, the God of Israel. Now let's see what happens when the earth, the heavens dropped and the clouds dropped water. Skip ahead. This is the other uh, section here I've uh, projected for you. Verses 20 and 21. From heaven the stars fought. Their courses fought against Sisera. Listen. The torrent Kaishan. What did it do? Swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kaishan. By the way, that word torrent, same word, wadi, river, torrent, same word. March on, O oh my soul, with might. This is what the wadi, the river Kaishan, became a raging torrent that laid waste to Sisera's armies and rendered those chariots, chariots worthless. Let me give you just a little peek into what this could look like. This isn't what happened, but we've captured a, a little snippet, like a 20-second video of a flash flood through a wadi in the Middle East. It's not in Israel. This one's in Oman. This was two years ago. Take a look. Footage is a little grainy there, but I think you get the drift, right? What happens in this part of the world when the heavens open up and these flash floods come sweeping through? What's your point then? What's, what's the point? Here's the point. The Lord is mighty in battle, and he knows exactly what he's doing. There's no one that can thwart his hand. Isn't that how we started the service? Proverbs 21, 31, the horse is made ready for battle. There are some horses ready for battle here, horses and chariots, but the victory belongs to the Lord. He is mighty to save. Dear Christian, we live in a hard season of life. Pandemic, isolation, economic struggle and turmoil, relational strife, political upheaval. There's a lot going on. I just want to ask you, in what or in whom are you trusting today? The Lord is the only one worthy of our confidence, of our trust. He's the only one who can deliver in the end. And he is well able to save, well able. One more takeaway from this victory song. We're almost done. This song highlights two categories of people. I want you to see them in chapter 5. Two categories of people among ancient Israel. There, there were what was called, what I'll call heart searchers, and then there were, there were what I'll call sacrificial followers. Heart searchers and sacrificial followers. I'm just trying to borrow the language from the Bible. I want to read you one, one little snippet here. Reread you one little snippet from chapter 5. We'll put the nail in the coffin. Chapter 5, verse 13. Then down sings Deborah and Barak. Down marched the remnant of the noble. The people of the Lord marched down for me against the mighty. From Ephraim, their root, they marched down into the valley. Following you, Benjamin, with your kinsmen, 
from Machir marched down the commanders from Zebulun, those who bear the lieutenant's staff. The princes of Issachar came with Deborah and Issachar, faithful to Barak, into the valley. They rushed at his heels. Among the clans of Reuben, however, there were great searchings of heart. Why, why did you sit still among the sheepfolds? To hear the whistling for the flocks among the clans of Reuben, he repeats it. There was great searchings of heart. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan, and Dan, why, why did he stay with the ships? Asher sat still at the coast of the sea, staying by his land. Zebulun is a people who risked their lives to the death. Naphtali, too, on the heights of the field. Did you see these two groups of people? These two different categories of people here in the song? Heart searchers and sacrificial followers. I want you to listen to what one commentator says about these two groups. He writes, it wasn't that Reuben didn't think about going up. No, the Reubenites discussed the matter thoroughly. Excuse me, thoroughly. They talked a lot about it, but it wasn't, listen, it wasn't a good time to leave the sheep. And Dan and Asher evidently were preoccupied with their profitable maritime trade. And then he quotes Jesus. I've bought a field, and I must go and see it. I pray you, Lord, have me excused. Why'd they stay back, essentially? Why? The same reasons we do. Busy work schedules. They had families to feed. They were preoccupied with their flocks and their fishing boats. And then there was the very real danger. Because following God's will, contrary to popular opinion, is not always the safest place you can be. For eternity, yes. But there was very real danger here. Very real uh, risk. Some of these guys rushing out into this battle, commended in this song, could have died. Likely, some did. Sometimes, following the Lord involves risk. Sometimes, following the plan that Jesus has for you will involve you sacrificing something. Even something good. Two times, two times we see this right here in the text, this tension. Did you hear it in Reuben? They were weighing the cost. They were counting the cost. Verse 15, with great searchings of heart. Repeated in verse 16, great searchings of heart. Friends, I'm, I'm convinced that nowhere is their greater searchings of heart than in church on a Sunday morning. It's when we feel God's conviction. It's when we are reminded of who we are in Jesus and what he calls us to do. But we don't let that godly conviction brought to you by God the Holy Spirit override our personal commitment to safe, comfortable lives in the here and now. Oftentimes, to use New Testament language, we let the cares of this world keep us from following courageously after Jesus. Keep us trying to straddle the fence as if we could pull that off. It's just like Jesus said in that passage in Luke 14 when he called people to follow him, but they all alike began to make excuses. I bought a field, and I must go out and see it. I bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Great searchings of heart. I want to ask you as we close, in our dark day, what will be said of you? In 
this day, in this hour, the people of God must rise up and follow their Savior. Spiritual battle, that's what this is. Great searchings of heart. Are there worldly concerns that are keeping you from following what Jesus has called you to do? You got a cutter off there. 